a giant of American Jewish life. Passed away on Friday, January 22nd, the 12th of Shvat on the Jewish calendar. Rabbi Dr. Eugene B. Borowitz passed away at his home in Stamford, Connecticut at the venerable age of 91. On Sunday, a large gathering joined his three daughters, Lisa, Drusi, and Nan, their families, and the extended Borowitz family, grandchildren and a great-grandchild, at Temple Sinai, where many people spoke eloquent words of praise and respect, awe for Jean Borowitz's remarkable brilliance of mind and clarity of thinking, as well as words of profound love. There are many great rabbis on the world Jewish scene, and when any one of them passes away, the Jewish community, as our tradition tells us, is diminished by the loss of their presence and charisma and teaching. Each of them merits words of recognition and appreciation, but sometimes their passing goes virtually unnoticed by the Jewish community at large and even here on JBS, though we do try to pay tribute to any rabbinic gadol who leaves this earth. But when it comes to Jean Borowitz, viewers of JBS have been privileged to learn from him in many ways. For Dr. Borowitz not only touched the lives of hundreds if not thousands of young men and women who sat and learned from him as they became reform rabbis at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in New York, or the tens of thousands who read many of his 16 groundbreaking books on Jewish thought, Jewish philosophy, Jewish theology, and Jewish ethics, which were at the heart of all of Dr. Borowitz's thinking. Jewish ethical behavior as it flows out of a covenantal relationship with God. And Jean Borowitz was never afraid to talk about what it means to be a modern, reform, liberal, committed Jew who lives in response to a God who commands a life of ethical righteousness. In addition to all those he touched through reading one of his wonderfully accessible books, or by hearing him lecture somewhere, often as a scholar in residence around the country, or to be a student in his classes on Jewish religious thought, Jewish philosophy, and Jewish education, which was his first specialty as a very young rabbi working for the Union of Reform Judaism. So much of what JBS is, and for that matter, what I am as a rabbi, flows from my personal extraordinary good fortune of being his student, and for a wondrous period of time, his most trusted student during my years at HUCJAR in the late 60s and early 70s. He was my advisor, my mentor. I wrote my rabbinic thesis on the rabbinic concept of ahava, love, with Dr. Borowitz. And he was always Dr. Borowitz to me and even after I became a rabbi colleague, when he insisted that I, like all of his former students, called him by his first name, Gene, whenever I would speak to someone else about him to this day, I refer to him as Dr. Borowitz. And in 1970, when Eugene B. Borowitz had a quixotic dream of creating a revolutionary bi-weekly publication, very simple, no pretense, either in format or in cover, but a publication of significance, of consequence, in which, for the very first time at that time in history, members of every movement of Judaism across the academic and political spectrum would dialogue in a safe forum of publication. That was Jean Borowitz's idea. And he gathered a most impressive group of contributing editors that included some of the most brilliant minds throughout the Jewish community, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, Reconstructionist, 
academicians, political activists, young and old. And every two weeks, this unpretentious masterpiece would open intellectual and spiritual and communal vistas of understanding in symposiums of Jewish thought. He named it simply Shema, which of course means listen and evokes the most important Jewish line in our tradition. But it was Shema, a journal of Jewish responsibility. And lucky, lucky me, he asked me to be his first assistant editor. And week after week, I worked alongside Dr. Borowitz, publishing Shema magazine, and coming into contact myself with some of the most outstanding, exciting personalities on the world you were seeing. One of the founding members of Shema's contributing editors was a young, dynamic, modern Orthodox rabbi who would become the chairman of the first Jewish studies department at CCNY and would then go on to become the rabbi of the Federation movement and later still the founder of Klau and then one of the most important and respected voices on the world Jewish scene to this day, the brilliant Irving Yitz Greenberg, who stood shoulder to shoulder with Jean Borowitz in helping to shape modern and postmodern Jewish life. I had the opportunity to speak with Yitz Greenberg, who's in Israel, about the unique and profound contribution of Eugene B. Borowitz. Here's my conversation with Yitz Greenberg. Yitz Greenberg, thank you so much for spending a moment with us, talking to us about Eugene B. Borowitz. It's wonderful to include you, and I know you're in Israel right now, so I appreciate your going out of your way to participate in this program. Thank you for inviting me. I, um, I feel, as frankly, as uh, hundreds of thousands of millions of Jews feel very keenly the loss of, of Gene, and uh, he played such an important role, not only in our community, but for me, in my personal life, that I am happy and privileged to be a small part of this program that is trying to remember him and think about him. Yes, thank you so much. By the way, Yitz Greenberg, here you are. You were one of the young, shining lights in modern orthodoxy, and Gene Borowitz was in the reform movement. How did the two of you first come together? What was your first meeting, uh, e either literally or in general? How do you remember coming into contact with each other? Well, I, came, I met Gene before I met Gene, meaning uh, his writings. Uh, this, I would say, in the, I hope my memory is not betraying me, in the late 50s or early 60s, uh, came across his writings. I was a modern Orthodox Jew, but I had, you know, lived in a yeshiva world most of my life. And when I came out of that cocoon and went to college and graduate school, ran into a lot of modern questions and issues, and looking around for somebody who could help me reconcile or at least relate the modern things I was learning with the traditions that I had learned and, and loved, um, found Gene's writings immediately <laughs> both helpful and influential. Mm -hmm. um, so I met him before I met him. Then the personal meeting, however, that followed came, I think, in the 1960s when in Canada, David Hartman of blessed memory and myself and others organized a get-together of rabbis to learn together. And we invited not just Orthodox rabbis, but um, conservative and reform. And Gene was one of them. And uh, we not only met the, the, the person and found the, the charm, the warmth, and the humanity, uh, as was more, which was even more attractive or magnetic than his writing, mm -hmm. but um, I would say it was that was a particularly fundamental turning point in my life, personally. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that I myself was wrestling with the impact of the Holocaust on my thinking and had challenged much of my certainties and understandings of the tradition. 
And emotionally, I was feeling more and more that it's not just Orthodox Jews that carry the Torah or that carry the mission of the Jewish people or that, frankly, they stand for as the God's people. It's no other way that the Nazis understood that and were out to destroy all Jews and reform Jews just as much as Orthodox. But I was emotionally there, but I didn't have the key element until I met Jean and Fackenheim and Jacob Petachowski and Herman Schaumann and a whole group of such people. For the first time, I'm ashamed to say it, but it's true, for the first of my life I met Reform Jews who were serious, spiritually, intellectually profound, whose reform and whose changes from the tradition reflected moral and religious insight and depth. It was a breakthrough for me in two ways. It made me realize that reform is a valid and powerful and important stream of Jewish religious thinking and understanding. Mm-hmm. And that, that was, that's a turn me into a pluralist. It, tra- it literally mm-hmm. changed my life, mm-hmm. not necessarily for the better politically in my community, <laughs> but in any event, that changed my life. I uh, understand. And, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I know you helped him with, and that's how I first came into to know you myself, was Shema magazine and this extraordinary quixotic venture of his where he thought to do something which at that time in the in 1970 was a was just a total breakthrough the idea that people from various movements would dialogue in the same place together on social jewish political any issue at all of Jewish concern, and Shema, he subtitled, A Journal of Jewish Responsibility, and you were one of the founding contributing editors. Speak for a moment about not only Shema magazine, but that era, which, if I'm not mistaken, Yitz, during that time you also became the, the head of the Jewish Studies Department at CCNY, which was the first time there was a Jewish Studies Department at CCNY, one of the first Jewish Studies programs in the entire country. But that was a very exciting, dynamic time. And you uh, and Gene Borowitz and you know the others who were on the Shema magazine masthead, you were doing something ahead of your time and remarkable. Speak for a few moments about that period of time. Well, of course, it was the 60s, very exciting, and the Jewish community and the Jewish people were coming out of the shelter. Some of that shelter was imposed on us. America was opening up and Jews were entering into it as never before. And again, Gene was one of the great pioneers and uh, and leaders, and I include Shema in that way too. It was certainly his vision and his initiative. I was happy to cooperate. But his initiative here was not just the pluralist side of it, which was very exciting, but the responsibility side of it, to take up social justice issues, to deal with the entire society and its needs and its problems, to apply, you know, uh, Judaism to the real life and the constant dynamic changes, whether it was the sexual revolution or whether it was the civil rights movement, etc. Again, he was a leader and a pioneer in all these areas, and I was glad to uh, work with him or follow him or, or all of the above. So, uh, and that was exciting because I think we had this vision, it wasn't just in one denomination, uh, but groups of people in all the denominations had this vision that Judaism really can enter into American society and influence it and shape it and have a dynamic presence. Uh, Of course, I saw then, and we all saw then, that if we didn't raise the level of Jewish responsibility and intellectual and religious spiritual vitality, that opening up could lead to assimilation and a lot of negatives. But we believed that the country, this would be an opportunity for Judaism to flourish and to, and to shape American society and to be worthy as a partner in this incredibly you know, important democracy that was trying to move to a new higher level. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll add a personal story because you mentioned CCNY and Jewish studies. That's a good example. Again, the whole university area, Judaism was, you know, was missing. It was something you studied in ancient history or it was something left behind cultural backwater, and suddenly there was a chance to teach it in contemporary academia. Well, there's a personal story there because Gene was not only a friend and a colleague, an intellectual stimulus and conversationalist, but he was also a mentor and a friend. And 
Gene set up the first programs in Jewish studies at City College. He reached out to me and invited me to teach a course on the Holocaust in that group of courses. And the truth is the course went well and it connected to the students. And within a year, the, department, the school decided to set up a department and I became, as a result, one of the candidates. I believe Gene served on that selection committee, and in the end I, I was uh, offered the job as the chairman to create the full-time department. So I always felt there was just a personal gift and, and, and a friendship statement from Gene as well, as well as obviously the opportunity to work in the pioneer on the frontier of Jewish studies in academia. That is a wonderful story. Talk one more moment about the fact that here you are in the Orthodox world, and Gene Borowitz is in the liberal reform world, and yet he seemed yet to transcend Reform Judaism as a thinker who influenced people well beyond the specific movement of which he was so important. Talk to me for a moment about how you see the broader impact of Eugene B. Borowitz on Jewish life as a whole. Well, in an open society and in a culture where advanced education is now universal, and for Jews particularly, we have the highest rates of university and graduate school training of any community in history, probably. Uh, in that kind of a community, it's not enough to have traditions and practices and social realities. You have to have a credible, persuasive, profound um, discourse cultural language of understanding of religion, and otherwise people will see it as, you know, primitive or, or quaint or, or ethnic, whatever it is, and it doesn't have persuasive or influential power. Gene was, again, a, a model, a pioneer in, in so many areas. I, I, Jewish-Christian dialogue, for example, again, which we've had one of the great religious revolutions of all time in Christian rethinking of Judaism and respect for it. And, of course, uh, Jews at the beginning of the stage of coming to understand Christianity in pluralist and in respectful terms. He was a pioneer in that, I worry, or again, in, as I said, in social justice or his writings on sexuality, again, applying Judaism to day-to-day -to -day life. That influence went beyond reform. His idea of covenant as a crucial element and that reform that covenant was a meaningful way in which the reform emphasis on autonomy could be reconciled with discipline and with commitments to tradition to past. Again, uh, I, or David Hartman, did not uh, have the same conclusions in terms of halakha or, or practices, Gene, but the fact is that that model was very much something that either influenced us or enriched us or gave us something to play off or we disagreed with it. Uh, so he he made a contribution not only to his movement, and I think that's part of his authenticity and originality, but he also made a contribution to the general field of Jewish thinking, Jewish thought, to the growth in many other denominations and in academia mm -hmm. of it's a sophisticated you know, religious thinking. So um, I think his kind of, of course he had also a moral contribution in the image of a Jew. What Heschel did in Rights Association, Gene did in so many other areas of applying the tradition, you know, to the social justice issues of American life and Jewish life. So I think he will obviously remain an icon of the reform movement, but his contribution goes far beyond it. I would add one other comment to it, and that is I think he pointed the way for reform in a way that has not been fully realized yet, namely that it would have to be reconciling its autonomy with a deeper rootedness in Absolutely. tradition and in values. Very important position, which the movement has be did begin to do under an influence in part, and many others carried it on. But, but uh, having said that, it, the movement hasn't, in my judgment, enriched itself enough in all the ways that Gene called for it, and that's the crisis that we're all race struggling with, with not to be assimilated rather than not integrated, but assimilated in this culture. So not only is his contribution a lasting one, but his challenge to us, to all of us, uh, to shape up morally, intellectually, spiritually, goes on. And I think his influence will continue and his role model will continue to inspire and challenge people to get, a, to 
get to greater levels, higher levels. You know, Yitz, every generation has their Gedolei Hador, and how lucky I have been because of my association with Gene Borowitz to meet and become close to people like yourself. You are also one of the Gedolim of our generation. It's an honor to be able to include you in this tribute to Eugene B. Borowitz. I wish you all the best health. You should be safe in the state of Israel. And when you come back to the United States, maybe once again we'll have a chance to talk in studio. But I thank you not only for participating in this moment here on JBS, but for all you've done for me over my entire rabbinic career. And people should know, the first time I ever taught on a college campus, it was in your Jewish Studies program at CCNY. And since then, there have been many times you and your wife have been extraordinarily kind and giving to me. And I love you very, very much. And again, I just hope I get to see you very soon. Thank you so much. You've given me as much or more. So it's been a pleasure. And thank you really for including me in this tribute to Gina. I, I, it's a privilege and, and it's a pleasure. Thank you, my friend. Be well. The thoughts of Yitz Greenberg, who again is just, as I said, he is one of the great figures of 20th century, 21st century Jewish life. And it was wonderful to be able to include him in this program on Gene Borowitz, Yitz Greenberg. Another colleague of Gene Borowitz, who also began as one of his students, is a gentleman who has made a major contribution of his own to reform Judaism and to Jewish life throughout the world. Rabbi David Ellenson, who served as president of HUCJAR from 2001 to 2013, and then who upon his retirement and is becoming HUC's Chancellor Emeritus, also became the current director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis University. I also had the opportunity to speak with David Ellenson about Eugene B. Borowitz. What a pleasure I have now to be speaking with David Ellenson. David, thank you so much for joining us. Well, really my pleasure. David how did you first come into contact with Eugene B. Borowitz? Well, I first came into contact with him, frankly, through the written word. I was living in my native state, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and in a Greyhound bus station. Yes. Amidst all sorts of pulp novels, the book appeared, A Layman's Guide, to Religious Existentialism, yes, which Dr. Borowitz had written. I purchased the book, read it very eagerly. I had just taken a course in contemporary Christian religious existentialism, and here there was a profound Jewish thinker speaking on these themes. He introduced me in that book for the first time to Franz Rosenzweig, and I felt I need this man to be one of mm -hmm. my teachers in life. And in fact, he became uh, one of the major factors in my decision to attend HUCJIR when I applied to the rabbinical school. Five years later, he actually was my teacher uh, in modern Jewish thought at HUC. Okay, David, you and I both experienced him as a teacher. I want to hear how you would describe his presence and what was special about being a student of Jean Borowitz's. Rabbi Borowitz was powerful, charismatic, brilliant. Uh, I found him to be the most compelling, one of the two most compelling lecturers I ever had as a student. The only person comparable to him who taught me was actually Arthur Hertzberg. Mm -hmm. uh, both of them had an absolute command over their field of study. And Rabbi Borowitz could explicate the thought of Mordechai Kaplan, Joseph Soloveitchik, Abraham Joshua Heschel, uh, notions of rabbinic theology through Agadah in a way that was, quite frankly, incomparable. I was tremendously excited by the passion with which he uh, related these topics. 
and the clarity with which he could explain complex philosophical and theological ideas uh, was absolutely remarkable. There yes. was no one who really had uh, yes. his ability. That can come out of only an absolute command yes. over the uh, subject area. What I also remember is that he was devoutly spiritual and religious. Uh, when I had him, he would begin every class uh, with a bracha, Asher Kiddushana B'mitzvotah V'tzivanu L'asok B'divrei Torah, that God commands us to engage in the study of Torah. And at a school and in a time when it felt at HUCJR that many of our student professors were principally academics, I always thought of him as a rabbi. I right. still hear him saying yes. to us, you know, what is your covenantal obligation? Uh, he was not embarrassed to speak of God and the sense of obligations that we had as liberal Jews uh, to our covenantal tradition. You have touched on so many of the unique brilliances of Gene Boris. I never saw anybody able to, both on the one hand, David, synthesize the complex philosophical, yeah. philosophical thoughts of the major Jewish philosophers of the 19th, 20th century, but also, David, to present and craft his own postmodern theology and thought that has influenced many individuals going forward. Well, I think what Dr. Borowitz was also able to do was that he could build both upon them and upon the rabbinic tradition. You know, many of us forget the fact that he also wrote a major analysis of uh, what he labeled the word game of rabbinic theology. It was published by the State University of New York Press, and this allowed him to draw in his own writing on covenantal theology on trends, on strands, both from modern or from modern Jewish thought, modern philosophical, theological thought in general, and the Jewish tradition uh, itself. His emphasis on the notion of covenant allowed him to speak with a rare type of Jewish authenticity, mm -hmm. and he was determined that the heritage of, uh, as he would phrase it in my conversations with him, in quotes, the Teutonic geniuses, <laughs> mm -hmm. meaning people like Hermann Cohen and the whole 19th century German idealistic tradition, simply was not uh, sufficient to speak to the religious needs, the religious existential needs of Jews in the late uh, 20th century. And that is why I believe he turned to people like Martin Buber and Franz Rosenzweig and others who represented a more romantic and existentialist position in modern Jewish thought to begin to craft his own uh, theology. His work, Renewing the Covenant, of course, published in the 1990s by the Jewish Publication Society, was really his magnum opus. And I know that at the end of his life, he was very, very proud, extremely proud, that his work, Renewing the Covenant, was translated into Hebrew. Yes. Uh, I think it was translated as Kiddushah Shel Habrit. Uh, quite literally, the renewal of the covenant, and it elated him to think that at the age of almost 90, he had, as he put it, made Aliyah. Yes, it was a lovely idea, a lovely idea. Look, David, you served as president of HUC from 2001 to 2013. You're now Chancellor, Chancellor Emeritus. Finally, put Dr. Borowitz into perspective for Jewish life as a whole. Again, all the things you've said are the remarkable qualities which enabled him as a reform spokesman to create a sense of commitment to Jewish tradition in the progressive wing of American Jewish life. For you, as you, you know, the sweep of his, of his entire life and contribution, what do you think will stand out as the enduring legacy of Eugene B. Borowitz? Boy, that is a wonderful question. By the way, I am very impressed that you add the B to his name. I once wrote an article on him when he was 70 years old. It was a tribute in the Jewish Book Annual, and I entitled it a tribute to my teacher, Eugene Borowitz. And Dr. Borowitz wrote me <laughs> and said, would you mind 
putting in the letter B, he said, my middle name is Bernard, and I always promised my mother that I would uh, retain yes. always that initial yeah. so that uh, well, you're I sweet was, to was say mindful that to of me. that. It sounds like you were mindful as well, just Thank a digression you. Uh, before the question. I think his real legacy is that uh, Rabbi Borowitz really did not intend his work nor was it aimed exclusively at what I would call a classical reform Jewish audience. He exactly. attempted to speak yes. and provide a nuanced language for all liberal Jews, a broad swath of people who were committed seriously to Jewish religious tradition, but simultaneously completely open to the lessons that could be learned uh, from the modern world. His concept of the Jewish self, which meant that what we learned from modernity was the emphasis upon autonomy, but that that autonomy for a Jew to speak authentically had to be grounded in the tradition, will remain, I believe, his most enduring theological, philosophical legacy uh, to the Jewish world. But having said that, he also purposefully wanted to create dialogue across classical or traditional denominational boundaries. Yes. He taught, along with Michael Wishegrod and Seymour Siegel, uh, at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He founded Shema, which at the time was virtually unprecedented. It allowed Jews from every walk of life, uh, both professional academics and lay people, to discuss issues of uh, ongoing and contemporaneous Jewish interest. He told me that he had the idea of publishing Shema actually from the work of Leopold Suns, uh, the great 19th century uh, German Jewish scholar uh, that Professor Suns had uh, not only, of course, written great, great academic works, but that he participated actively uh, in the life, the issues of the day uh, that marked German Jewry in the 19th century and that Rabbi Borowitz felt why is it we're not able to create this kind of forum for uh, Jews in the latter part of the 20th century in America? So that I think that his ability to speak across denominational lines and attempt to provide an articulate and passionate and religiously committed Jewish voice for people in the non-Orthodox Jewish world will remain a vital part, a central part of his enduring legacy uh, as we move into the 21st century. Of course, as with many people of his type, he was a unique type of Ma'ayan Hamid Gaber. I mean, his work continued to be uh, fertile. His mind was extraordinarily uh, nimble, mm -hmm. and he thought in extremely creative ways, and Frankly, I don't know if there's really anyone who uh, was really comparable to him, and I don't know precisely how we will fill his, uh, his place. His will, influence on Jewish thinkers all across the spectrum is immense, and a number of younger scholars, Jonathan Crane, Rachel Shabbat Beit uh Simon Cooper, an Orthodox scholar, all of them have written works now, uh, dissertations devoted to Rabbi Borowitz, and his work, Peter uh, Oakes from the University of Virginia, uh, in his work uh, on uh, covenantal thought and uh, hermeneutical textual thinking. All of these thinkers uh, are greatly, greatly indebted to Rabbi Borowitz, David Novak from the University of Toronto. All of these people have great respect for Dr. Borowitz and participate as active dialogue partners with him. I think now, too of the work of uh, our friend and colleague, uh, Rabbi Elliot Dorff, the respected uh, conservative theologian who is head of the Rabbinical Assembly Law Committee. Rabbi Borowitz carried on dialogue with an infinite number of um, interlocutors. I like to think that perhaps now in the uh, Yeshiva Shomala, the heavenly court, he's not only speaking again with Stephen Schwartzchild and Arnold Jacob Wolf, but that he and people like Michael Wishegrod are uh, continuing their own theological discussions and debates uh, before the Holy One. Mm -hmm. One last question for you, David. 
you know, for most students at HUCJAR, he was a very intimidating figure, very demanding. Yes. Never, he, he was willing to say anything he thought was honest. He demanded honesty and demanded competence from his students. And if somebody was intellectually sloppy, he was yeah. all over them. And there were many students who were more frightened of him than anything else. Well, you got, wait, a minute, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute now. No. You got to know him very well. What was the soft side of Gene Borowitz? Well, I'm going to tell a couple of stories that in that regard. First, I want to affirm every word <laughs> that you have uh, have said. I think all of us lived in dread. You may remember this of what I would call the green pen, where in those days he would write his uh, observations. Uh, Do you know why, the, David? Why it was in green? No, that I'm not aware of. I will, tell you, I will tell you. He also taught a course in education, and of course, education is where he came out of at the Union before he became a professor at HUC. Right, he and, had his doctorate in education yes, from e Columbia. Exactly. And he made a point of teaching us that one should be as, should not be intimidating of our Hebrew school students. And he felt that the red pen jumped out at whomever was looking at the note and was too jarring, and that a green pen was softer. He also always taught us, David, that when you teach Hebrew, there's a tendency for a teacher to always interrupt a child with the word no, no, no. And his whole point was, say yes when the child gets something right. Say yes as often as you can. Do it with a green pen and with the word yes. That's why he used a green pen. That is fascinating. Thank you. In light of the question that you asked me, um, I want to tell you a story. When I was first appointed as president of the College Institute, I went out to lunch with Rabbi Borowitz. And in the midst of the lunch, he said, you know, David, uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, when I taught your generation of students, uh, you know, I realized that you all did not love me. He said, I want you to know the students today love me. Yes. And I said, oh, no, no, Dr. Borowitz, we loved you as well. <laughs> and he went, no. He said, that isn't true. He said, you respected me. You stood in awe of me. You feared me. But he said, I actually am a much nicer grandfather <laughs> Then I was a father. Yes. Uh, I got a real chuckle out of that, because, of course, we did love him. Yes. But we had tremendous uh, respect for him. I think of the words, uh, your ava facha, yes. uh, uh, fear and awe. And I think we did stand somewhat um, in that way in front of him. I do remember, and I'm sure you do as well, when we used to have the uh, legendary uh, sermon critique after each of us as juniors and seniors would deliver sermons, we all stood uh, in fear and trembling because Absolutely. he would always offer Absolutely. last comments, mm -hmm. and he usually very sharply indicated how we could uh, improve the work that we did. However, once, I will never forget in the class, he did not end one of the sermon discussions. Um, and privately, I asked him why that was the case. And he said to me, I know that all of you think that I'm being very strict and critical with you um, when I speak to you the way I do and offer suggestions or directions for improvement. But he said, the truth is I do that because people come after a long week at work and they deserve to receive the best instruction that you can possibly give them. And he said, my remarks are intended to improve that instruction. Mm -hmm. He said, today what you heard, and he only said this to me privately, uh, the student who spoke delivered the best he could possibly do. And there really was no need to uh, offer further critique. Um, I thought it was a remarkable uh, insight into, uh, into his character. Um, the truth is, I loved him uh, very, very deeply. Yes. And had it not been for him, I do not know if I would have become 
the president of the College Institute. Frankly, I enjoyed academia very much, and I loved my life as professor. As president, there were many duties that I felt I had to fulfill, and I will never have a position ever again that will be as significant as a position I held as president of the College Institute. But I cannot say that I enjoyed it in the same way that I enjoyed mm-hmm. being a teacher. And I heard before me Rabbi Borowitz saying, David, when I was considering uh, adopting or stepping up to the position as president, he said, what do you think your covenantal responsibility is? What is it you think the Jewish tradition and God are saying to you at this moment? Uh, and I have to tell you, it uh, was the decisive turning point in the decision that I made to become president of HUC, wow. AIR. And I thought of his words uh, always while I was in that position. Well, I am so glad he influenced you in that direction. You have made a fabulous contribution of your own. And you have spoken about Dr. Borowitz, Eugene B. Borowitz, in a, in a most loving and perceptive way. I thank you so much for being part of this tribute to a real giant, a gadol of our generation. And David, I hope you and I will sit together in studio in the very near future. Thanks very much, and I'll look forward to uh, when this comes on the network. I love your programs. I watch them constantly, and uh, we're big, big fans, my thank wife. Thank you, David. And I. Be well. Be well. Bye-bye. The thoughts of David Ellenson, again, who from 2001 to 2013 was the president of HUCJAR, but he started simply as a student of Eugene B. Borowitz. The thoughts of Rabbi Irving Greenberg and Rabbi David Ellenson, who from very different parts of the Jewish world, each were powerfully influenced and moved by Rabbi Eugene B. Borowitz. Of course, I've already referred to the enormous influence Dr. Borowitz had on me personally. Actually, I first met him when I was a student at Columbia College doing a weekly radio series on WKCR called Approaches to Religious Concepts. And on one program, I had the amazing opportunity to sit with three brilliant lights of American Jewry from JTS, Rabbi Simon Greenberg. From Yeshiva University, Rabbi Manny Rackman. And from HUCJAR, a young rabbinic star, Rabbi Eugene B. Borowitz. All three were out of this world, and I fell in love with Dr. Borowitz. Upon entering HUC in New York, I was totally taken by his approach to Judaism and his commitment to Judaism. And you've heard he was a frighteningly imposing figure, tall, demanding. And he was, in his early years, more feared than loved, though I loved him from day one. Later in life, he softened. And he became as beloved as he was, respected and revered. He had an extraordinary grasp of Jewish thought, from Midrash to the classical and modern philosophers. And he had an extraordinary talent at synthesizing the thought of the great philosophers, Rosenzweig and Beck, Kaplan, Heschel, and especially Martin Buber. And Jean Borowitz's lecture explaining the meaning and power of Martin Buber's I and thou relationship and how it manifests in human relationships and is a model for a personal relationship with God. That was a lecture that moved everyone who heard it and opened up ways of thinking for me that helped to shape my own life and Jewish philosophy. Indeed, there are so many ways in which my life flowed out of my years of intimacy with Dr. Borowitz. He sent me on my first trip to Israel as a thank you for my work on Shema magazine. It was for the entire summer 
where my firstborn daughter was conceived, Sarit Ahava. And this week I'll celebrate the bar mitzvah of my first grandson, her son, Aaron Jonah. It was on that trip to Israel that I was invited to become the rabbi of a small group of Jewish families in Stamford, Connecticut, who wanted to study the meaning of being Jewish as adults. That group became the Chavura, which I have served and which has become my extended family over more than 40 years. And when I teach, I begin every session with the bracha Dr. Borowitz taught us when we were students in his classes at HUC, La Asok B'divrei Torah. I never use a red pen when marking papers, only green. And I try never to say no to a student, but rather almost try again. Most of all, yes. Or my own variation, Mitsuyan. Excellent. And after rabbinical school and some years after WMCA Radio in New York, I went off to create my own Jewish Education in Media, a nonprofit organization devoted to producing educational materials using the electronic media. And Jeb's first production was a weekly radio series called L'Chaim, which has never missed a Sunday over the last 36 years, and which is now seen on JBS. L'Chaim was patterned after Shema magazine, and many of the people I have worked with on L'Chaim were the same people I worked with when I was assistant editor of Shema. They became my panel of commentators and would appear each week on L'Chaim including, of course, Eugene B. Borowitz, who was an enormous source of encouragement to me in those early years of GEM, Jewish Education and Media. And L'Chaim grew into JBS. So if you like JBS, you have Rabbi Eugene B. Borowitz to thank. And for many years, for Yom Kippur, we have replayed my conversation with Gene Borowitz on L'chaim, in which he spoke about the reality of God. Here's a moment from that L'chaim program. In a sense, the most complex, extraordinary thing we know is a person. Therefore, while God isn't a person, God doesn't have fingernails and require a manicure. But to use personal language to describe God, although it involves us in all these problems of gender and inclusiveness, nonetheless allows us to render this extraordinary range of things that one needs to connect with ultimate reality. I mean, we are not talking about something small here. Throughout my life, Gene Borowitz was a presence, whether I saw him often or not. When I received my honorary doctorate from HUCJAR, I was presented by Gene Borowitz. When I was honored by the Jewish Historical Society, Gene Borowitz was there to say words of love on my behalf. And that's the side of Eugene B. Borowitz that ultimately dominated his being. He had always been a loving man. I'd seen that over and over when visiting him in his home in Port Washington, seeing the loving relationship he had with his spectacular wife, Estelle, whom he encouraged to have her own career to become a psychotherapist. And his love for his three beautiful daughters, Lisa, Drusi, and Nan, and later in life, he and Estelle moved into a residence where my mother-in-law was already living, called Edge Hill in Stamford. And there he became 
a beloved and respected figure as anyone had ever been, anyone who ever graced that building. He became an unassuming member of the Stanford Jewish community and of Temple Sinai and a most beloved part of the Shabbat study group there. And everywhere he went, Jean Borowitz left his indelible imprint of awesome, brilliant intellect and of all-consuming love for the Jewish tradition and a sense of a commanding God requiring ethical conduct that reflects the highest Jewish value of derech eretz, respect for the worth and dignity of every human being. From the beginning to the end, it was the force of his personality and his character and his commitment which served as a model for all of us. Student of all ages from day one to the last day of his 91 years on earth and which earned him the respect and love he enjoyed his entire life and which solidifies his presence among all the G'dalei Hador that have preceded him, the great ones of the generations, and all those who are yet to follow in his footsteps. And to me, Dr. Eugene B. Borowitz was a father figure whom I loved very, very much, and I will forever be grateful and in his death. Thank you, Dr. Borowitz. Mitsuya, Mitsuya, Mitsuya. Eugene Bernard Borowitz, scholar, thinker, activist, rabbi, mensch. Zecher Tzadik Livracha, the memory of your righteousness will forever be a blessing. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.